says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. We're going to begin by singing number 138 in our books, which is a version of that psalm, psalm number 138. I'll praise you, Lord, with heart content and joyful. Number 138. as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we bow before you this morning together with hearts that indeed are joyful, full of gladness that indeed we're your people, not, not the worshippers of any other god or myriads of man-made gods which are but the vain imaginings of people's hearts. But no, we worship you, the God of life, the God of love. And so we are joyful and content because we know that in knowing you, there is no greater thing. And we thank you, Lord, for 
your greatness and for your glory and for your goodness towards us, frail creatures of dust as we are. For you are a God who draws near to the lowly, to the humble in heart, the proud, the, the haughty, you will disdain, you will depart from, but a bruised reed you won't break, and you are indeed swift to answer the prayers of those who humble themselves before you, who call out to you, who are your true children, and you are the God who delivers us. All because your steadfast love does last forever. Your covenant blessings are sealed forever. And of that we have such a great assurance in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Because in him we have that life, life everlasting that he has won for us because he has carried away all the terrible legacy of our sins, all their penalty, all their guilt and shame forever in shedding his own precious blood for us. And so we can sing forever, you will keep your face towards us. And now we rejoice with great joy that that is so. And so, O oh, Almighty God, who alone can order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning. If you're visiting with us here uh, at the Tron, then you're very welcome. And that perhaps especially if it's your first time with us, we do hope you'll feel at home here uh, as a family of God's people. And I uh, hope we have a chance to, to meet and greet you after the formal part of the service. <laughs> You should have these sheets on your uh, chairs. Let me uh, just draw them to your attention. On the front page, there's all our services today. This is number two. There's three more to come, so do come and join us at one of these others. There's uh, uh, our two evening services here in particular at 6.30, our English service here and our Farsi service too. And uh, you'd be most welcome to come and uh, join us. Inside, there's uh, details about what's going on in the life of the church this coming week. <coughs> on the right-hand side there, do be praying for Christianity Explored. It'll be the third week. Uh, it's just about not too late to come. You would still be very welcome if you'd like to come and join in. If you've been wanting to do that but have missed the first two, uh, you can still come this week. Probably this week is the last time when that's possible. But uh, do be praying for it. If you'd like to know more, uh, do have a word with me after the service. But uh, Wednesday evening, you'll note there, is our fortnightly congregational prayer meeting. Do come as we join together as a fellowship right across our congregations to pray for our partners all around the world and for the work here and in many places. So at 7.30 on Wednesday, uh, please do come. Just see down at the bottom there, uh, do be praying for Ash and Susie as they get married on Saturday. And uh, many friends, I'm sure, will be there. We wish you very well for that and uh, trust that that will be a day of great joy for you and uh, for many who are with you. Back page, uh, two things to mention. Uh, first of all, the welcome tea. Uh, if you've been, you've been coming around uh, the church here for a little while and uh, beginning to feel a little settled here, well, why not come along on uh, Sunday the 13th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon for a cup of tea, some cakes, and it's just an opportunity to meet some of the staff and leaders of the church uh, to uh, uh, tell you about all the different things that go on, just so that you can have a bit, of a, a bit more of an idea of uh, what it means to be uh, part of the fellowship here. We'd love to do that. And uh, there's an opportunity there on the 13th. So please, can I encourage you? Uh, perhaps you've been coming around for a number of months. You're beginning to feel uh, you know your way around. But there's lots more to find out. And we'd love to, uh, to tell you about that. So that's an opportunity for that. Then finally, there are these uh, little colored uh, invitations here for a women's breakfast on Saturday the 12th of May. 
You can tell it's a woman's breakfast, can't you? Because it's all muesli and fruit and <laughs> melon and nonsense like that. No bacon and eggs. That's the men's breakfast. But um, if you want a healthy breakfast uh, and you're a woman, come along on uh, Saturday the 12th and uh, catch up with some others in the church family and have something healthy to eat. And uh, the men will be at home enjoying bacon and eggs while their wives are absent. So uh, we'll all have fun that day. Good. Well, we're going to uh, turn to our Bible readings this morning. And um, as you're turning to page 879 in the Church Bible, let me welcome our guest preacher this morning. It's lovely to have Alan Purser back with us. Alan is a, a regular visitor, or at least has been for many years. He comes up to teach at the Cornhill Training Course. And uh, he's always good enough to preach for us here in one of the services. Alan was, uh, until fairly recently, working with Crosslinks. And uh, you'll recall some of you that he's told us about his various travels around the world. He retired from that particular ministry last year. But of course, there's no such thing as retirement from the Lord's work. And uh, he's still keeping himself very busy with all kinds of other ministries. And uh, we're delighted that he's here with us uh, today. So welcome, Alan. Welcome back uh, among us. We have a short passage this morning. We're looking at Luke's gospel, and we're going to read just a little section in chapter 19 at uh, verse 41 to 44, where in this second part of Luke's gospel, as Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem to enter his glory, to go to the cross and to be raised from the dead, he has just finally entered the city what we call a triumphal entry. And then we have these rather poignant and somewhat troubling words in verse 41. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden for your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they'll not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Amen. May God bless his word to us. We're going to sing once again. This time it's in our blue hymn books, number 664. A hymn that asks that question, have you heard the voice of Jesus softly pleading with your heart? Have you felt his presence glorious as he calls your soul apart? Number 664.
Well, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received now. As we do that, and as the musicians play quietly, you might like to read again some of the verses around those that we'll be studying shortly there in Luke 19. As we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. Let's pray together. Oh God, our Father, as we come before you and as we acknowledge the offerings that we bring through all of the life of our fellowship here in time, in talents, and in money, we remember our great calling that we have from you to go into all the world and to make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that you commanded your apostles, and through them all that you have commanded the church, including ourselves. That the great task of these last days, of this last age, is that the sound of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ should be heard in every part of this earth until the great day of your coming when at last this earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And so, Lord, we look out upon our world, a world full of so much uncertainty, so much nervousness, so much to make our hearts fear and worry. So many things bombarding us constantly in the news. The great movements of power in the world. The great issues of states and nations. Some at war with others. Others at war within. Some dealing with growing senses of economic foreboding. It's so hard for us, Lord, to feel safe in this world of ours with all that is so threatening. And yet, Lord, we thank you that in you we have a God who is Lord of time, Lord of history, Lord of all. And therefore, though we don't know the intricacies of the needs of nations and rulers, Though we don't have the insight into all the issues which do command our prayers, nevertheless, we know you and we know your power. And so we can lift simply as children to their father, lift into your hands all these great issues which perturb us 
and which fill our minds. We think of the goings on in the Far East and these extraordinary historic talks between North and South Korea, and the forthcoming meeting between the North Korean president and the president of the United States. We ask, Lord, that although all these things seem so surprising, naturally there is a great deal of warranted suspicion. We ask that there might be indeed a breakthrough and that there might be a measure of peace and stability delivered to that region which has so long and so recently increasingly lived in fear of the apparent aggression that emanates from that country. We think of the Middle East, Lord, and the ongoing saga, the terrible, costly saga of the civil war in Syria, that even as various coalitions have managed to dislodge the forces of ISIL from large parts of Syria and from Iraq, nevertheless, there still remains such a terrible humanitarian tragedy which has unfolded there for so many years and still shows no sign of abatement. And the greatest minds in the world are at a loss as to know how to intervene or whether indeed it is possible to intervene without causing even more calamity. We bring that whole situation to you and very especially, O oh God, we ask for our brothers and sisters in Christ in that land many of whom have had to flee, many of whom face greater hardship and persecution now than ever they did, even under the unswaying rule of the dictator, President Assad. We pray for them. We pray for all the dispossessed there, all those who have lost so many loved ones, so many children, and we cry to you, O oh God, for mercy, for a restraint of evil, for the measures which might bring to peace, or at least to a greater stability and to a country that can be tolerated and lived in by ordinary people. We think of Yemen, the ongoing conflict there between rebels and others backed by Iran and between the government backed by the Saudi Arabians and all the complexities again of that internecine and tribal warfare and so many other conflicts around the world that remind us so forcibly, O oh God, of what it is that emanates from the heart of man, which so often is destructive and dark and so damaging of human life and flourishing. And where those desires are accompanied by wealth and power, it seems that they are so greatly magnified. Forgive us, O oh God, we pray. Forgive every one of us for the part that our minds and hearts play in so many other things, perhaps lesser things, but which do so much to destroy and to disfigure the beauty of this world that you have made, the wonder, the nobility of the human life that you have created in your own image that still displays so much of the creativity and the beauty and the love and the capacity to love and the capacity for good, all of which comes from you, our great creator, and yet has so blighted even these things alongside with so much that is dark, so much that is evil, that springs from the selfishness and the desire to rule ourselves that is so deeply woven into the fabric of our fallen sinful hearts. And so, Lord, in the light of all of this truth about our world, we pray for your church, which is your divine answer to the needs of this world as it carries the message 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom alone is to be found and shall be found your abiding, eternal answer to the tragedy and the corruption of this world. Give your church, we pray, in this nation and in every nation, clarity about the true message of the gospel of Christ, the King and Lord, who one day shall return to judge all the earth. And give her confidence, we pray, in that gospel, which is itself the power of God for salvation to all who will believe, cutting through the darkness of this world, cutting deep into the darkness of the human heart to bring light and life. Heavenly Father, forgive us when so often we have been cowed by the opposition of this world, embarrassed even sometimes to stand for the Christ who is our Savior, ashamed of his name and ashamed of his gospel. Forgive us, we pray, and once again, restore in our hearts such desire and such love for your kingdom and for your glory and for the salvation of so many souls whom you loved and came to shed your blood for. Restore in us, Lord, such an urgency, such a love for your gospel that above all other things in our lives, its cause and its triumph would be the goal of our lives. Each one of us as Christian people, but all of us together as your church in this city and our different locations and manifestations. Help us, we pray, to be single-minded for the truth. And so, Lord, as we come to your word now and as we open it and seek in it the very light of heaven, we pray that you would touch our hearts, open our ears, soften our hard hearts, and make us, we pray, glad hearers and ready responders to the words your Spirit has written and to the words your Spirit again speaks to us this very morning. Draw near to us, Lord, as we draw near to you in faith. And feed us for our salvation. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as we come to God's word, then we sing once again the hymn on the screens, our version of the Lord's Prayer. Just uh, be careful with the words this time. We've done a very slight revision of some of the uh, last lines, hopefully to make it a little easier to sing. So uh, you probably know it by heart by now, so you'll have to just relearn it. Uh, there we are. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children.
Amen. Well, good morning. It's very nice to be with you. And um, I've had a treat already this morning because um, I had my first ever visit to Kelvin Grove Church. And that was great fun and marvelous to see it and uh, begin to flourish and, uh, and get established. We, um, <clears throat> we're involved in just beginning to think, I say we, I, I, I recently moved to the high peaks of Derbyshire and uh, my wife and I are living in a town called Buxton and we join in a church called Trinity Buxton and we have just been given the opportunity to um, think about launching a new church uh, a little to the north of us and we're trying to work out how to do it. So it's a marvelous to see what progress you have made. We've been thinking about the language of uh, building church, and uh, that language is very important. This morning, we're going to be looking at this small section in Luke 19, and I think maybe if you could turn to that, that would be a help to me and I hope to you. In our church Bibles, the page number is 879. And it's uh, this uh, short passage as Jesus approaches Jerusalem. We're going to be learning from this passage about a way of thinking, about an attitude, a way of looking at a city. But before we do it, I, I, I want to say something about analogies. People speak, don't they, of church planting and of church building and it's very interesting how powerful analogies are because an analogy shapes our thinking and it um, gives rise to other ideas things that flow from it we uh, make inferences we draw inferences from the analogy that we're thinking about the bible has some very fine analogies and I think we do well to ponder them, to employ them, and to stick to them. And not to muddle them up. And I, I fear that every now and again we do muddle them up. And so uh, we, in our thinking, have been trying to get our heads around this idea of launching a new church and what the right language is to describe it. Sometimes people talk about church planting, but interestingly... The New Testament doesn't. So would you keep your finger in Luke for a minute and come forward to one of the letters of the Apostle Paul. Luke, of course, was Paul's traveling companion, uh, the former medic who now was taken up with gospel ministry. Uh, it happens, you know, every now and again. Thank you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, I'm going to pick up at verse 5. This is page 953 in our New Testaments. Uh, the Apostle Paul was the one who established the church at Corinth. He now writes a letter, and uh, we in our church in Buxton have been preaching through 1 Corinthians, so we've been very much focused on all of this. It's it's a pretty somber letter, to be honest. Um, the rebuke that Paul has to give to the Corinthians is comprehensive and multifaceted. But in this little passage, he's calling them back to how the gospel was established amongst them. And he is uh, addressing a certain divisiveness between them. So let me pick up at verse 5. You'll uh, see why I'm doing it in a moment. Paul writes, what then is Apollos, what is Paul, servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Now, you see the analogy he's working with. Do you see that? It's the analogy that we find on the lips of Jesus in, for example, the parable of the sower. Remember, the sower goes out to sow the seed, and the seed fall, falls in different soils, 
The seed is the message preached. The soils represent the hearer. And as the seed, which is the gospel, falls into the soil, so the preacher's job is done. Because it is God who gives the growth. Now that's the horticultural analogy. Are you with me? The horticultural, yes, is the planting analogy. So what do we infer from that? Look at verse 7. What we infer is that neither he who plants nor he who waters, Paul describes a policy's follow-up ministry as watering, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. And in the language in which Paul is writing, this New Testament Greek language, he says, ute, ute, nothing, nothing. That's what I am, nothing, no, I'm just a servant. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. The we there is the apostles. You, you Corinthians, you are God's field. And there's the horticultural analogy. But notice what happens now. He suddenly switches analogy. Do you see that? For he's not now dealing with that original evangelistic ministry when he turned up and preached Christ and him crucified to this great city of Corinth that did not know the truth of the gospel. Now he's writing to believers who are in the church at Corinth. So look what he does. He says, you are God's field, change analogy, God's building. And so he switches from the horticultural analogy to the architectural one, if you like. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Here is the analogy then of building. And what you do with churches is you build churches. You can't plant a church. You plant the seed of the gospel. It produces believers, and believers, like living stones, the Apostle Peter describes them, get built into churches. But these analogies are significant. Look at what Paul infers from this analogy. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, he says in verse 11. And the foundation is Jesus Christ. So, end of verse 10, let each one of you take care how he builds. Paul's not saying that the builder is nothing. He thinks there's significant work in building. We need to learn to be master builders, to take care over how we build, to make sure that we build on the same foundation, which is the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, analogies matter. If I think I'm church planting, then I will simply preach and then go to sleep or play golf or something, because God will do it. Now, that's the big lesson, isn't it, about evangelism. We don't, we're not able to convert anybody. And so Jesus uses the farmer analogy, doesn't he? The farmer sows the seed, and then he waits. He doesn't forever dig it up to see whether it's actually going to produce a crop. He knows that the power in the seed has the power to produce the crop. Of course, we pray that God would do that work, But church building is quite a different matter. Church building takes time and effort continually to keep building because it's working with people, with believers. It's building believers up into church. And Jesus is the foundation, implying, of course, that it's the cross of Jesus and his saving work that we proclaim, that is the resurrection of Jesus that we celebrated at Easter, that gives us our hope, 
that it is the very example of Jesus that we model ourselves on in our thinking and our attitude. So analogies matter, and uh, we have been trying to get our head around this, and I'm hugely encouraged to see that you have as well. I hope, therefore, that this morning's passage is going to be one that informs our attitude as we do this great work. The planting work of proclaiming the gospel, the building work of growing churches. So will you come back with me to Luke 19? It's right, isn't it, in these weeks after Easter that uh, we reflect on Jesus' mission and on what it was that moved him. At this point of Luke's gospel, we stand right on the brink of what is called the Passion Narrative. Very soon, the Lord Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, and go to his death upon the cross. Luke has a great story, doesn't he, to tell. He begins with the story of Jesus' coming, how he was born at Bethlehem, how the angels sang at his birth. He tells of his childhood and his public ministry of words and of works. The coming of Jesus dominates the first part of Luke's gospel, right up until chapter 9. But then we read of a whole change of tenor in the narrative. For toward the end of chapter 9, we read that Jesus set his face to go up to Jerusalem and that he knew that what awaited him there was indeed his death. Jerusalem, of course, high up on the hill, and as Jesus makes the journey from Galilee in the north of the country, south toward this city, you climb up to Jerusalem. In our Bibles, it's called the triumphal entry, isn't it? It's at least the triumphal approach. We celebrate it on Palm Sunday. And as Jesus enters the city, he acts out that great prophecy from Zechariah, riding in not on a great stallion as a Roman general would, but in humility on the back of a donkey. The disciples and the crowds are singing the Psalms of Ascent. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Do you see that in verse 38? Its significance wasn't lost on the Pharisees, those experts in the law. They turn to Jesus and addressing him as teacher say, rebuke your disciples. You can't have them saying that. They're speaking as if you're the Messiah King. To which Jesus responds, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. For Luke, he is indeed king, and he comes in great humility. And when he drew near, verse 41, and saw the city, he wept over it. Now, I don't know whether anybody here has seen the great city of Jerusalem. It is a fairly impressive sight, and so far as we can tell, it was a very impressive sight then. So we're bound to ask the question, well, why? I, why, why was Jesus driven to tears? What was it that moved him so deeply? Was it perhaps the um, architecture? I mean, did he feel that really the modern architecture hadn't done justice to the, its history and its uh, great distinctive role in the nation. Uh, my wife and I used to live in um, what is known as uh, the Docklands area of London, Canary Wharf. I had occasion to drive down recently. We now live in the 
glorious countryside of the high peaks of Derbyshire. As one sort of drives down the M11, there is a certain moment when the sort of full horrors of the architectural mess that is Canary Wharf becomes apparent on the horizon. And we uh, rejoice that we aren't living amongst it any longer. Is, is that what drove Jesus to get out his handkerchief and to weep, do you think? Now, you don't look persuaded. Well, was it perhaps the, the lack of infrastructure, you know, the, uh, the, the poor water supply, uh, the problem with the uh, electricity or whatever it was? Do you, do you think that was, no? Okay. Uh, what about the transport system? Do you think he was just hacked off with all the uh, donkey jams? Or was it more serious than the economic disparity within Jerusalem, the haves and the have-nots? Do you think that was what drove him to despair? You see the question we're asking, what, what is it about Jerusalem that drives him to tears? But perhaps it was the political oppression, living under Roman rule, being run and organized not from within, but from a distant city that really didn't sort of care about them. People do get upset by that, I'm told. What was it that drove Jesus to tears? Well, it's an important question, isn't it? Do you ever notice what it was? Have a look with me. Look down at verse 42. Because he makes it very clear. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Here then are the words of Jesus, looking over this city. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. What is it that drives him to tears? It is the ignorance of the inhabitants of the city. Would that you, even you, had known the things that make for peace. By ignorance, we don't mean to suggest that they were unintelligent. We don't mean to suggest that they couldn't think properly. But what he laments is that despite all of their teaching and training and intelligence and ability, they didn't know the one thing that matters above all others. Would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace. I wonder how you feel as you look around your great city of Glasgow. How do you feel as you notice people heading in all directions, what will you be feeling tomorrow morning as you head off to work or back to college or to the school gate or wherever you find yourself? For Jesus, what drove him to tears was their ignorance of the things that make for peace. Now, had you been reading Luke's gospel through from the beginning, you would be aware of how important Peace is. For right at the beginning of Luke's gospel, we understand that the coming of the Messiah King is going to bring peace. Keep your finger here. Just come back with me for a minute. Let me just pick out some. I think these will all be very familiar verses to you. Come back to uh, Luke chapter 1. Do you remember uh, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, and his great song? He speaks in verse 76 of John the Baptist being called the prophet of the Most High, who will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of, say it with me, peace. You see it? It's right there at the beginning. 
And so, as Mary's child is born, the angels sing, 2.14, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is well pleased. The aged Simeon, who takes the infant Christ child in his arms in the temple. Do you remember what he says? Lord, now you let your servant depart in peace. And as Jesus embarks on his public ministry, time and again the blessing he gives is the blessing of peace. Do you remember the woman who wept over Jesus' feet and washed them with her tears because we're told her sins were many. And she finds mercy and forgiveness from Jesus is sent away in peace. That other woman who'd been the victim of medical malpractice for as long as 12 years, who just touched his cloak in the crowd as he went to heal uh, Jairus' daughter. Immediately she was made well. Do you remember? Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And Jesus' disciples were commissioned to go to houses and to say, peace be to this house. This is peace not in the sense of absence of conflict. It's not peace in the sense merely of the cessation of war. Glad we prayed for Syria in those terms this morning. But this is peace, not between man and man, but between people and God. This is the peace that Christ alone can give. It's the peace that came to a remarkable character at the beginning of Luke 19. For as Jesus enters Jericho, you remember he encounters this very wealthy tax collector, Zacchaeus, And Zacchaeus marvelously repents and believes. And Jesus says salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus finds peace with God. The tragedy of Jerusalem was that unlike Zacchaeus, it didn't recognize the one who was visiting it. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. It's as if Jesus looks into the future and laments not only that they failed to recognize the opportunity they had when he came to them, But he sees now that it is almost too late for a terrible prospect of judgment and destruction awaits them. Look what he says, verse 44. They will tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Luke is writing these things in the early 60s AD, some 30 years after the great events that he's describing. Within less than a decade, these words were fulfilled as the general Titus sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in AD 70. And Jesus sees into the future the prospect of that terrible judgment. He understands the cause of it is because they have rebelled against God and rejected God's one and only Son. And it moves him to tears. Friends, how do you think of them, of your city? What will you think tomorrow morning when you find yourselves in a traffic jam? What will you think as you see the hordes 
of able and organized people heading off around the beginning of their weekly business. How do you look at your city? Jesus drew near and saw the city and wept over it. Have you ever been moved to tears like that? I think this passage has profound implications for how we engage in our gospel planting and our church building activities. I've got three suggestions for you. It may be that you will have others. Think with me, if you will, about these three at least before we finish this morning. Here's the first one. What we are shown here is that God has feelings too. God has feelings too. You have feelings, you're used to feeling emotions. How do you think God feels? I know that very often we speak, don't we, of God as high and mighty, lofty and lifted up. Above all, he is the king. He is the creator king and the ruler of the universe. If we could but see into heaven, we would see, as John saw, that heaven is dominated by a throne and the throne isn't empty. For one sits on it who is the ancient of days, the Lord Almighty, the great I am, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the God who revealed himself to Moses. Yes, he is there and he rules. And yet, all of that can teach us to think of God as other, as being distant, as being somehow above us. And those things are true. But he became one of us in Jesus. The word made flesh. And here we have revealed clearly to us as a window into the heart and mind of our Savior that God has feelings too. His lament was accompanied by tears. Tears for the city because of his love and concern for the people. Tears of lament because of their ignorance of the things that really matter. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Incidentally, that is a great way to speak to friends who are not yet believers. To ask them, my friend, do you know the things that make for peace? Are you at peace with God? It's a good way to kick off a conversation. Perhaps there are some here this morning who know in their own hearts and minds that actually you don't yet know peace with God. The marvelous blessing of the gospel, the reason the Lord Jesus came into this world, the reason he died upon the cross for our sins and rose again on the third day was that each and every one of us, whatever our background, our language, our culture, whatever our upbringing, whatever our age, whatever our gender, whatever baggage we carry, may by God's grace know his peace, the peace of sins forgiven, the peace that renders death as but sleep, the peace that tells us that we are a beloved child, the peace that enables us to hold our head up high and to walk before him. If you don't know that peace, well, please don't rest until you do. But please understand that that peace is the very blessing of the gospel for you. But Jesus lamented that the mass of people in Jerusalem were ignorant of the things that make for peace and headed for destruction. And he felt that deeply. God 
has feelings too. That's my first big lesson from this passage. Here's the second one. God doesn't delight in judgment. He delights in salvation. It was a cause of grief to Jesus that these people were headed for destruction. He longed for them to understand, to open their eyes, to see, to grasp their opportunity before it was too late. The Bible is full, isn't it, of emphasizing this great truth. Yes, we are told that God is the God of judgment, that he will one day condemn sin. And yet we are told that God is a God of love, that God, in the words of Ezekiel, doesn't desire the death of a sinner, but rather that he should turn from his wickedness and live. It took Jonah a while, didn't it, to grasp that? Do you remember? It took Jonah a while to come to terms with the fact that God actually meant what he said. Jonah wasn't all that thrilled, was he, when the people of Nineveh repented. Jonah is not an example to us of godliness. We're not to imitate Jonah, but we are to imitate Jesus. You know, godliness is to do with being like God. So we need to be like God, to rejoice in salvation, not in judgment. To feel as God feels. When was the last time you were grieved and moved to tears by the fact that this great city in which you live, where you are building church, is full of people who do not know the things that make for peace. And thirdly and lastly, you notice how this sharpens the focus of Jesus' mission. It's a big theme of this chapter. At the end of the incident with Zacchaeus, after Jesus rejoices that salvation has come to this most unlikely of people's houses in Jericho, we get a marvelous little summary of why it was that Jesus came into the world. Look at verse 10 of chapter 19. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I, I'm not at all sure that had you and I been in Jericho back there then, we would have imagined that Zacchaeus was all that lost. He was healthy and wealthy and seemed to have everything sorted. But Jesus saw him as a lost man. And now as he looks over Jerusalem, he sees a city of lost people. And he is moved to tears. Before long, he will be betrayed, arrested, and crucified. And it is the risen Jesus who then at the end of Luke's gospel commissions his disciples to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all peoples, beginning from Jerusalem. Isn't that marvelous? Beginning from the very city that Jesus wept over. Here then is the motive and the ambition for our gospel planting, and our church building. It is to proclaim the possibility of the forgiveness of sins, to make available that peace which the world cannot give. To be men and women who speak and who pray to that end. But please also, men and women who, like Christ, are moved to tears about the things that really matter, the things that make for peace. Let's pray together.
Our Lord God, you know our hearts and our minds this morning. We ask forgiveness when we have failed to be godly in the way we think about those around us. As we're stuck in a traffic jam, as we see the hordes of commuters, the great numbers heading on their way to work or to study, give us, we pray, the eyes to see this great city as on that day you wept over Jerusalem. We thank you from the bottom of our heart, our Lord Jesus Christ, that you went to the cross, that we may know peace with God. Grant a good understanding of those things for each one of us, we pray. Give us trust and confidence in your saving work that we, though we were lost, can know that now we are found and rejoice in that peace which you alone can give. And then we ask that we may be those who are gospel planters and church builders. So build your church amongst us, we pray, for your great praise and glory. Amen. Well, we close by singing the hymn on the screens, or walk with Jesus, and you will know how deep, how wide his love can flow.
Let's pray as we close. He has exalted above all things his name and his word. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.